Hi, this is Manos Brilakis, and this is video 22.2 for the Manual of Percutaneous Coronary Interventions. This video discusses management of coronary instant restenosis. We will go over each of the 14 steps of percutaneous coronary intervention and how they apply to instant restenotic lesions. Very important is step number 13, intravascular imaging, for understanding the mechanism of stent failure that has uh, significant implications regarding treatment. And these are the three main categories of instant restenosis mechanisms. The first one is stent under expansion. The second one is neointima or neoatherosclerosis formation. And the third one is stent fracture. This is an example of a patient with instant restenosis. There is a waste in the balloon. And this is an example of stand under expansion with a minimum instant area of 4.3 millimeters square, whereas more proximally the vessel is much bigger at more than 7 millimeters square. This is another patient that has occlusive instant restenosis. And here, intravascular ultrasound shows that the mechanism is tissue formation inside the previous stent. This is the second category of neointima hyperplasia or neoatherosclerosis. And this is an example of stent fracture in a stent placed ostially in a saphenous vein graft to the right coronary artery. We can visibly see the discontinuity in the stent struts. This is an example of repetitive movement in a hinge motion of the stent that likely led to stent fracture. So going over each of the 14 steps, starting with planning, for instant restenosis, it is critical to review the previous angiograms, as well as the reports, so as to know what stents have been placed and what previous treatments have been done to the target coronary segment. Monitoring is done, as in every other procedure, paying careful attention to the pressure in the EKG. In terms of pharmacology, sometimes silostazole has been given to reduce the risk of neointima formation, although there is not very strong data regarding its efficacy. If the patients present with instant restenosis and an acute coronary syndrome, then typically a more potent P2Y12 inhibitor, such as prasugrel or ticagrelor, are given along with aspirin for 12 months or more. And finally, if brachytherapy is done, then indefinite dual antipetalate therapy is needed to minimize the risk of stent thrombosis. Either femoral or radial access can be used for treating instant restenotic lesions. And engagement is done as per standard fashion, as described in previous videos. And geography is important to determine the location and the extent of instant restenosis. The most commonly used classification is the Meran classification that classifies the instant restenosis patterns to either focal or diffuse. Diffuse can be inside the stand, that's pattern 2, can be inside and outside the stand, that's pattern 3, or it can be a complete occlusion, that is pattern 4. Having complete occlusion is more challenging to treat. Essentially, this is a CTO. And the risk of recurrence is also significantly higher. When it comes to visualizing the stand, using advanced imaging techniques such as the clear stand and the stand boost techniques, what they can do is highlight better the stand stretch and allow appreciation of stand fracture, as was the case in this patient. The target lesion is often self-evident in instant restenotic lesions. However, sometimes coronary bypass graft surgery may be required if uh, repeated treatments of that instant restenotic lesions uh, keep on failing. Step number eight, wiring. This is an important step. Every time that the guide wire is advanced through a previously placed stand, there is the possibility of the wire going under the stent struts, and then that can hinder delivery of other equipment, and if equipment is delivered, that can lead to deformation of the stent. This is an example of a patient with previous stents. The equipment cannot go through, and this is likely because uh, the wire has gone under a stent strut, and indeed, after rewiring, 
using a knuckle wire, then the equipment could be easily delivered. This is another example of a patient with an underexpanded stent using a knuckle was successful in going through the previous stent and subsequently treating it. So using a knuckle wire can be very useful if the wire keeps on going under the stent struts. Lesion preparation, step number nine, is very important for instant restenotic lesions. Pretty much every lesion gets uh, ballooned, balloon angioplasty is done, but there are many other modalities that can be used, such as drug-coated balloons, brachytherapy, and more aggressive modalities for undilatable lesions, such as atherectomy, laser, lithotripsy, and subintimal techniques. Plaque modification balloons are often preferred for treating instant stenotic lesions because they are less likely to have the watermelon seeding effect moving back and forth, which might lead to injury of other coronary segments, the so-called geographic miss, that can lead to instant restenosis. As we discussed before, the treatment of instant restenosis depends heavily on the underlying mechanism. If the mechanism is under expansion, then different treatments are done to help expand the underexpanded segment. If the mechanism is neointima or neoatherosclerosis, then treatments are those that inhibit formation of those tissues, such as drug eluding stents, drug coated balloons, or brachytherapy. And if the region is stent fractured, then either another stent is placed, or if there is repeat stent fracture, sometimes coronary bypass craft surgery may be required. Here are some examples. This is an example of stent under expansion. And this is the algorithm that is typically used, which starts with high pressure balloons, use of the plaque modification balloons, followed by laser with contrast, then atherectomy, subintima lesion crossing, and coronary bypass craft surgery, with intravascular lithotripsy becoming an increasingly used modality for this subgroup. This is uh, the case we showed before with under expansion on a stent placed in the right coronary artery that is visibly ap apparent even on angiography. This case uh, was eventually solved by using laser. This is laser together with contrast injection. We can see bubble formation. After doing that, then the stent could successfully be expanded with a nice result. Still, intravascular imaging is critical because sometimes stent under expansion may not be angiographically uh, visible. Moving on to neointima and neoatherosclerosis, as discussed before, the treatment for this is uh, either providing medication through a drug eluting stent or through a drug coated balloon, or by doing coronary brachytherapy that inhibits formation of new tissue. Drug coated balloons are preferred if there is focal instant restenosis or if this is the first episode of instant restenosis, especially in patients with bare metal stents. Also, it is preferred if there are multiple stent layers and if there are multiple major side branches, as placing another stent might lead to compromise of flow into those side branches. This is an example of a patient who has instant restenosis of the obtuse marginal branch. And then by using intravascular ultrasound, it becomes apparent that there is actually tissue formed inside uh, the stent. And that was treated with coronary brachytherapy. This is the coronary brachytherapy train that is applied into the target coronary segment, reducing the risk for recurrent restenosis. Moving on to stent fracture. Stent fracture is typically treated by placing another drug eluting stent, although if there is recurrent stent fracture, which is possible, then sometimes coronary bypass craft surgery may be required. There are different types of stent fracture, some more pronounced and some less pronounced. When should another stent be placed for instant restenotic lesions? In general, stents should be avoided if uh, there are multiple layers of stent. However, stents may be needed if there is a suboptimal result with a drug-coated balloon, if uh, there is a large dissection, which is uh, described in the EAPCI document as a more than 2 millimeter length, 
more than 60 degree angulation or any flow limiting dissection. If there is diffusion stent restenosis, stent fracture, or there has been a previous failed attempt using a drug coated balloon. Closure of the access site is done as per standard practice. Coronary physiology is done infrequently for instant restenotic lesions. Typically, imaging is used. As we discussed, imaging is critical for understanding the mechanism of stent failure, and hemodynamic support is used if needed, depending on the patient's hemodynamics. In summary, the mechanism of instant restenosis is critical to deciding on treatment. If the mechanism is under expansion, then treatment focuses on modalities that can help expand the stent, such as plaque modification balloons, laser, atherectomy, intravascular lithotripsy now, high pressure or very high pressure balloons in Europe, and subintima lesion crossing. If the mechanism is neointima or neoatherosclerosis, the treatment focuses on delivering a drug, either through a drug eluting stent or through a drug coated balloon or using brachytherapy. And if the mechanism is fractured, then typically another stent is placed or coronary bypass graft may be needed. Thank you.